Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining me today. It means so much to me that each and every one of you has come here to take a peek into my past year's work at Cal State Fullerton. My master's project is about the pedagogical works of Florence Price, a 20th century pianist and composer who in 1932 became the very first African-American woman to have her classical music performed by a major professional orchestra. The day I listened to a recording of Florence Price's work for the first time, almost 90 years after her big compositional debut, I felt as if she was reaching straight through the speakers and writing directly to my heart. I felt an instant connection to her work because she had managed to synthesize two of my favorite things, American folk music and classical piano. All at once, being American folk inspired, the music sounded so familiar, and yet because of the juxtaposition with classical form, I had never heard anything quite like it. My ear is melody oriented, and I'm fond of the romantic and early 20th century styles. And for the first time in a long time, I felt like I was listening to romantic style art music that sounded unmistakably and quintessentially American. Price's involvement in the global movement by musicians and composers to write music that reflected the folk idioms of one's country, one's nation, was especially important because most concert music up until the 1930s had not acknowledged African-American music as quintessential in the creation of the distinctly American sound used by, say, Gershwin and Copland. Antony Dvorak, during his visit to America in the 1890s, had predicted that black classical music would take off, and Price is quoted as saying the following. We are even beginning to believe in the possibility of establishing a national musical idiom. We are waking up to the fact that we already have a folk music in the Negro spirituals, music which is potent, poignant, compelling, it is simple heart music and therefore powerful. It runs the gamuts of emotions. Excuse me, it runs the gamut of emotions. Uh, personally, after playing a lot of Price's work, I wouldn't say it was simple the way that she describes it. She was the one who composed it. She knows that best, but it was complex for me to learn, so I will say that. If you are keeping up to date with the happenings in the classical music world today, you likely know that Florence Price is having something of a posthumous renaissance that really gained momentum during the 2010s and 2020s. So, 
Why now? I believe there are three main reasons why Florence Price is experiencing her very own renaissance today and finally taking her place in the canon. The first reason is the hard work of scholars like the late musicologist biographer Ray Linda Brown, who discovered Price's manuscripts in the Yale Lar Library Archives many decades ago and decided to dig deeper. She interviewed Price's descendants, scoured the archives for her work, and analyzed an otherwise largely unknown body of Price's work until about 2020. The culmination of Ray Linda Brown's research was an incredibly detailed biography of Price titled Heart of a Woman, The Life and Music of Florence B. Price, which is um, that book cover, the top photo on my slide. The book was published on June 4, 2020 at the height of the George Floyd movement. The second reason I believe Price is gaining recognition is because black, um, excuse me, student activists all over the country are fighting for the inclusion of black artists in the history books and the concert halls. The third reason is the discovery of dozens of Price's manuscripts in her former residence by home buyers in the outskirts of Chicago in 2009. For these key reasons, the award-winning scholarship recent discoveries of Price's manuscripts, and the movement to decentralize the canon of Western art, I believe Price is finally getting some of the recognition she deserves as one of the most important 20th century American classical composers. So I want to talk a little bit about Price's work, um, her life and work, and before I do that, I just wanted to um, show you this beautiful photograph of Florence Price with her daughter, Florence Louise Robinson um, in her garden. So I thought that was a sweet photo and I wanted to include it for you all. All right. So despite the fact that Florence Price was a black woman from the South in the early 1900s during the Jim Crow era, she studied keyboard and composition at the New England Conservatory under the guise of Mexican ethnicity. She moved from her home in Little Rock, Arkansas to Chicago to escape the racial violence of the South after gaining her bachelor's degree at the conservatory. She got married and divorced, raised three children, taught hundreds of students, and all the while gained accolades and recognition in Chicago as a respected musician and music educator during her lifetime. Most notably, Price won the prestigious Wanamaker Prize in 1932 for her symphony in E minor, as well as for her piano sonata in E minor, which I will be performing for you after the lecture portion of my presentation. The Chicago Symphony, which at the time was an all-white symphony orchestra led by a white conductor, performed Price's E minor symphony, and in spite of the segregation and the customary etiquette of the day, Price was invited on stage after the performance to receive a standing ovation from the audience, which was usually unheard of for any black composer, let alone a black woman composer. Florence Price is known for incorporating the African-American spiritual idiom into many of her works that have a traditional European classical form. But what many people do not know um, is that her teaching pieces, which were mostly written for her classical piano students, make use of so many additional American idioms besides the spiritual. For instance, the cakewalk, ragtime, even Appalachian fiddle styles, jazz, blues, and folk music from the American South, all while preparing the young learners to one day play the works of composers such as Beethoven, Chopin, Schumann, Brahms, whose birthday it is today, Scott Joplin, Dvorak, Copeland, William Grant Still, and so many more. Price's pedagogical work is uh, where my research comes in. As someone who has passionately taught children the piano for almost 10 years, it excites me to examine repertoire meant for smaller hands and less experienced learners through a pedagogical lens. I believe it is of paramount importance for music educators to include the works of Price and others in their curriculum because it teaches students that there are phenomenal composers of all different backgrounds and identities who overcame unimaginable obstacles to give us the music we cherish today. Introducing students to outstanding black women who have been kept out of the history books and bringing these artists into the curriculum also shows particularly students of color and female students 
that they too can one day accomplish great things and go on to receive the acknowledgement they deserve. Representation in the classroom and the uh, arts matters. And when representation happens in an intentional way, we are all empowered and liberated from the harmful mentalities that divide us. I chose to examine nine exemplary teaching pieces by Florence Price that are at the elementary, early intermediate, and late intermediate levels. I picked these nine pieces because I noticed that they haven't really been addressed in depth in the musicological or pedagogical literature, but they are so effective at teaching different facets of American style, as it were, that I believe they really ought to be analyzed and addressed. I don't have time to go over all nine teaching pieces I examined for this project, but I will discuss the three pieces shown in bold today. Bright Eyes, Rabbit Foot, and The Goblin and the Mosquito. So first up is Bright Eyes. Bright Eyes is the second piece in three sketches for little pianists. It's in a lively compound duple meter, and it appears to be slightly more complex than the other two pieces in Florence Price's set. One pedagogical aim of this piece is to introduce a hand position in which the thumbs in each hand overlap, like so, as the hands take turns playing parts of the melody. Another pedagogical element is the proper counting of individual eighth notes, dotted quarter notes, and dotted half notes in 6-8 time. This is probably one of the first experiences that the elementary student will have with compound duple meter. So let me show you um, what bright eyes sounds like at the keyboard. teaching this piece is uh, you may need to coach the elementary student um, through positioning their hands in this unusual way that I mentioned. At this stage of an elementary student's learning, they have most likely encountered hand positions where both their thumbs need to share a key, such as middle key. But this piece takes the overlap literally one step further as seen um, on the top photo there. The right hand thumb is on C, but the left hand thumb is on B. Fancy that. You can explain to the student that the left hand can hover over the right hand and wait its turn to play D closer to the fall board than your right hand is, and that the right hand does not have to move out of the way when the left hand plays there. Rather, it should just stay put under the left hand in this case. Uh, this is a very unique technique concept Price has chosen to introduce to the young student, but it is not difficult for the child to achieve with some practice. The next thing I say the teacher and the student should practice in this piece is the eighth note rhythm in measures 17 and 18. You know? Uh, and I think as a teacher, you should demonstrate that while providing uh, the two strong beats per measure uh, with your hand or the metronome or tapping your foot, you know, the, the eighth notes fit in, can fit into that and you can internalize the rhythm that way. Then the student can internalize the rhythm of the six eighth notes and eighth frets by uh, using a syllabic counting pattern. So, ta 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 so they, can, they don't have to sing it, but you, as long as they can recite tosh, ta tosh, tosh, ta tosh, then they can say the rhythm, clap it, tap it on their lap. The end result is that the student should be able to chant the rhythm and feel the rhythm in their whole body. 
Finally, um, we can bring this concept out of isolation from the score and back to the keyboard, where they can take a look at the actual score and see how it's represented in musical notation. I find most of my students at this stage respond well to this process, where they hear a difficult rhythm first, do it, usually by rote, then see it uh, on the staff. This is the hear, do, see progression of learning, and it's typical of elementary piano pedagogy. All right, so the next piece I wanted to discuss with you all is Rabbit Foot, which is an intermediate teaching piece reminiscent of leisurely Appalachian folk melodies, adventure, and spirituality. The title refers to a common good luck charm used in many cultures throughout Europe, Asia, and Africa. And in traditional North American culture particularly, the rabbit's foot has historically been used as a protective talisman to warn away bad luck in the set of African-derived spirituals, uh, spiritual practices and rituals known as hoodoo. So the piece features pairs of eighth notes, such as grace notes, um, pairs of eighth notes as grace notes, excuse me, played before the beat. And uh, syncopated motives, dotted quarter note rhythms in the left hand, it has occasional pedaling, and various dynamic changes. The grace notes and rhythms found throughout the piece in the right hand are similar in style to the grace notes found in Appalachian folk fiddle music, traced back to the British Isles. So now let me play rabbit foot for you. Mm -hmm. 
So it's a really fun piece. And I think shaping, phrasing, and imagery are of the utmost importance in the Goblin and the Mosquito. Articulation and mastery of a few particular touches are key as well. In the piece, one of my students, Brooke, who I believe is somewhere in the audience with us today, um, she observed that there are moments of tension, relief, exclamation from the goblin, and taunting from the mosquito. Uh, for example, right here. You know. Can you guess what the goblin is doing and what the mosquito is doing? I mean, maybe this is the goblin trying to catch the mosquito, and this is the mosquito who has just gotten away and is going, no, 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 boo, boo, you can't catch me. <laughs> okay? So a little bit more on this piece. There is a cadenza-like section, um, which I didn't play yet, which my student, Brooke, brilliantly interpreted as a scene where the mosquito had its own personal time in the spotlight, away from the goblin. So let me just demonstrate that little section for you as well. And you can hear, you know, it's, it's in such a high register of the keyboard that there's no way the goblin is anywhere in sight. Maybe, uh, as, as Brooke, I think, mentioned, perhaps the mosquito is flying up in the air away from the goblin's abode. <laughs> okay. must be aware of each of these moments and what they represent in this character piece. The conceptual reinforcement of portato is significant in the teaching piece, and groups of several descending grace notes, you know, or ascending ones, implore the student to apply their technical mastery of ornamental broken chord figures in a slightly new context with non-chord tones. In the cadenza-like section, this one that I just demonstrated for you, uh, the student revisits an octave scale by playing two tetrachords with second through fifth finger in both hands, rolling everything quickly. There is frequent shifting to and from almost all registers of the keyboard, which means the student must be very comfortable identifying and sight reading notes that fall outside the staff. Or if they're learning this piece, you know, somewhat more by rote, I would say the student should at least already uh, be comfortable navigating all the different registers of the keyboard. The Royal Conservatory of Music rates the Goblin and the Mosquito as a level six etude, which means this teaching piece is being incorporated into the curriculum of young pianists around the globe. And that is so exciting to me. And so, some big ideas for the pedagogue that I took away from studying just a handful of Price's dozens of teaching pieces are as follows. First off, lesson plans for Price's teaching pieces should generally include learning objectives, key pedagogical elements, and required background knowledge. Also, for very young students, the instructor can include lots of enjoyable activities that follow the here-do-see sequence of learning, along with ample flashcard drills, general scale work, harmony work, theory work, and technique drills. The instructor may also feel free to guide the elementary student through any difficult hand position changes, articulations, and gestures as each piece demands. For older, more advanced students, Price's teaching pieces allow ample opportunity for the individual to develop their own taste, discretion, phrasings, and personal style. And so, in closing, the elementary and intermediate teaching pieces of Florence Price are incredibly valuable in the piano studio and the music classroom in general, especially for students who are learning how to use piano technique to express a unique American idiom in their classical playing. 
Um, and I just want to add as well that I think it has been said time and time again that when a student learns how to play the music of their native country, the country where they were born and raised, they will probably feel um, like a, a, an even stronger connection to the music because of its relationship with, say, the language they grew up speaking and the culture they grew up around. Um, so American students in particular could benefit from learning the works of Florence Price instead of following, say, like an all European kind of um, teaching curriculum. Um, it's critical for pedagogues who teach the works of Florence Price to understand the history of Price's compositions in the context of musical nationalism, neo-romanticism, and the black freedom struggle, and to put the materials into context for their students in an age-appropriate way. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, even though Price is most recognized for her integration of the African-American spiritual sound in her classical works, I believe that her teaching pieces reflect her interest in also passing down elements of other musical traditions as well, such as the cakewalk, ragtime, Appalachian fiddle music, and the folk music of the American South. Thank you to my mentor, Professor Allison Edwards, who devoted invaluable time and care to my advancement as a musician and a pedagogue. To Dr. John Cagle, who inspired me to choose this particular topic and dive into the research process with gusto, and to Drs. Matthew Thomas and Robert Watson, who graciously serve on my committee, and with whom I have had the immense privilege of learning um, at CSUF. Many thanks to my family, your continued support of my dreams through trying times made this entire degree possible, and my partner. Thanks also to the incredible friends I've made in this program who encouraged and supported me each step of the way, and to my childhood piano teachers for helping me hone my craft in the foundational stages. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs>